And in fact, Andy, while you were introducing me, I actually just did a different kind of telemedicine consultation, and that is a dog in Connecticut ate a mushroom, and the veterinary folks want to know, what next? <laughs> so you see? Well, as he said, I have spent the last 30 years of my life working on the intersection between technology and medicine. And I hope today to argue that we actually don't have a technology problem any longer. We actually have the tech we need. What we have is a psychology problem, how we use that tech, how our hospitals and doctors adopt it. So I'm going to cover five different emerging technology areas, and I know it's right after lunch. Hopefully everyone's had some caffeine. And believe me, I'm not going to talk about standards or cryptography or anything boring. I will try to make this as personal as I can. So let's start with something you probably hear about all the time, big data. Now, what is big in 2018? I'm not even quite sure. I have 11 petabytes of patient-identified data just at Beth Israel Deaconess. And you may ask, well, what is a petabyte? We'll tell you this. So it turns out you walked into this hall about a kilosecond ago. Now, a petasecond ago, there was a brontosaurus in this hall. That tells you what a peta is. It's a really big number. I got 11 of those. Now, why is that interesting? In December of 2011, my wife, who's Korean, was diagnosed with stage 3A breast cancer. She's fine today. That breast cancer was estrogen positive, progesterone positive, HER2 negative. Now, I'm sure you've all read the New England Journal religiously over the course of your careers, and how many clinical trials have been done on 50-year-old Korean women with stage 3A breast cancer with those biomarkers? The answer, of course, would be none. But over the course of 30 years at Harvard, have we seen a few patients just like her? The answer is actually we've seen hundreds. And if I have 11 petabytes of patient data, and I can use algorithms to say, hmm, I have a patient in front of me today. What can I learn about all the patients of the past that will inform patient care in the future? So we actually did that exercise for her. And what did we find? Although there's not been a lot of clinical trials on this, it turns out Asian women are exquisitely sensitive to Taxol. Taxol turns out to cause neuropathy, right? Numbness of hands and feet. My wife's an artist. So you can imagine if the outcome for her was total cure, but numb hands and no ability to create, that would not be a patient-centric outcome. So we said is we want cure, but we also want function. So we did a clinical trial of one. And we took her taxol dose in half with the agreement that if there was an issue where she had a recurrence, of course, we would look at alternatives. But at the end of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, she achieved complete remission and total use of her hands. All of that is a function of looking at the data of patient experience before her. And I think as we go forward, not over the next five to 10 years, but over the next 18 months, you'll see this explosion of the use of data in this fashion to help deliver more personalized, more precise care. And this is going to sound a little edgy, but where do I store that 11 petabytes of data? Amazon. Now, why? Am I, am I, am I, wait a minute. You know, privacy, security. Well, I'll ask you this question. How many security engineers does Amazon have? 5,000. How many do I have? Five. Right? So moving our data to secure hosting in the cloud with Amazon is actually a risk mitigation. And I tell you that because then the tools to do machine learning or artificial intelligence on that data in the cloud much, much easier than trying to bring those tools inside a hospital data center. Another quick example on machine learning. So turns out you're a young, healthy person. Finn. You have, however, an inflamed appendix. And you need your, your appendectomy today. How much time in the OR should we give you? Well, everybody gets an hour. But wait a minute. There are a million people like you in my database, and every one of them who's been young, healthy, with no, comor no comorbidities has had 25 minutes. 
So we can actually give you the right resource that you need to get the job done with quality and efficiency, appropriate setting of care, appropriate amount of medical expense. Yeah, we're already doing this. So I have about a dozen machine learning and artificial intelligence projects running at Beth Israel Deaconess today against that 11 petabytes of data that's really tailoring the care that is appropriate to the patient in front of us. So that's big data. Well, what about the Internet of Things? Now, again, you hear about this all the time. More and more of us are buying devices for our home. Now, it's a challenge, however. Now, is anyone wearing a Fitbit? Fitbits in the audience? Okay. It's a lovely device, but have you ever looked at your heart rate on a Fitbit? So it turns out you're running, maybe you're a little sweaty, your heart rate's 20. Now, <laughs> do I call an ambulance? I don't know. So, so this Internet of Things, I mean, a huge promise to deliver us more patient-centric care but fraught slightly with peril because we don't quite know when to believe the data and not. So if it's an implanted Medtronic pacemaker and it says your heart rate's 20, yes, I'm calling an ambulance, but if you're running with Fitbit, maybe I don't. But let me tell you why I think this is such an important revolution. Here's a personal example. And I should just warn you, so my wife and I have no privacy, right? It's okay. We've already signed consents with the compliance office. We have no privacy. It's, it's good. About six months ago, I used a blood pressure cuff like the one you see here, and I measured my blood pressure. Well, I'm a vegan for 25 years, a body mass index of 21. I'm a farmer. My blood pressure was 170 over 100. Like, how could that be? I eat nothing but rocks and sticks. I mean, come on. <laughs> and I was sure it was the cuff, you know, clearly. Measured it again, 170 over 100. So my clinician said, you know, being a CIO is very stressful. Cybersecurity, issues with doctors and nurses depending upon you. Maybe it's stress. Or if anyone's from Boston, maybe it's that Mass Pike commute. Right? Very, very bad. So he said, use your wired device to take a look at your blood pressure when you wake up, before and after your commute, before and after stressful meetings, maybe before and after too much green tea. And let's look and see, is there a correlation with a lifestyle issue? And it turns out there was none. Right? So, of course, I needed a few blood tests to make sure I didn't have a kidney problem or other medical condition. And ultimately, my clinician decided I inherited my blood pressure from my father. My, both my parents have had high blood pressure. And you can't choose your parents, right? So this is just something that happens to you as you age. So I was put on a beta blocker. Now, again, don't want to compromise anybody's privacy here, but if you've ever been on beta blockers, that's like negative espresso, right? I had two <laughs> negative espressos, right? <laughs> and what was the right dose for me? Well, wait a minute, you know, that's kind of not the way that electronic health records work. They say, you're a human, you get 50 milligrams, right? So I was put on a dose that sure controlled my blood pressure, but I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. And so I was able to use this electronic device in my home, go from 50 to 25. Oh, it seemed to be okay. Go from 25 to 12 and a half. Oh, it seemed to be okay. I did this in three days. Not every six weeks going back to a clinician's office until we got it right. Three days. So in effect, we use the Internet of Things to diagnose me and then to treat me and then to titer my medication to the right dose with few side effects without really my having to leave my home. Because all this goes from the blood pressure to my phone, from my phone to my clinician's office. And that is really how I see care being delivered in the future. We'll use those under $100 devices from Amazon to tailor care that's more personal and appropriate for us. Well, is this for everybody? My mother is approaching 80 years old. And I explained, very exciting, Apple and iOS 12.0 has HealthKit where she can download her XML formatted or fire enabled Argonaut standard medical record. And she said, huh? 
<laughs> I said, well, what about this? What if you could go up to a device in your home and say, when do I take my meds next? Which color should I take next? When's my next appointment? Um, am I eating right? Whatever. She said, oh, I do that. And so we started to, I, I, I give you this sort of disclaimer, Alexa, Siri, Google Home, not quite HIPAA ready yet. <laughs> but by the end of the year, we should see Amazon signing business associate agreements on Alexa by the end of the year, right? And so we've built 30 skills already for Alexa. We registered the term BIDMC with Amazon. So if the patient says, hey, Alexa, ask BIDMC something, then that comes to us and we answer. And we really think this is going to be pretty important. And on the inpatient ward, it's pretty straightforward. You're like, when's lunch? When do I get my pain meds next? When am I going home? But imagine on the outpatient setting. I'd like an appointment with my cardiologist in two weeks, hopefully at the suburban location, right? And those are the sorts of things, especially for those who aren't very facile with these devices, we think are going to be empowering to patients. Something else that we're starting to use is beacon technology. These are a buck. You put them on the wall. They've got a battery in them that lasts for a decade. And not only do we know who you are, but we know where you are. And therefore, we can set a context of the question and the answer that you might ask. Or do things like when a doctor walks into the OR, shut off their texting, right? These are the sorts of things that geolocation will empower. Cloud and blockchain. Now, you hear this term blockchain quite often. Be a little careful with it, right? This is not Bitcoin. We're not going to put Bitcoin dispensers in the lobby. That's not what we're talking about. What is the use case? So blockchain is a public ledger. It's something that anyone can read, and it is trustworthy. It's not operated by government or any corporation. So let me give you the example of what we're doing in South Africa. This is a Gates Foundation funded project. 65 million people in South Africa, 16% have HIV. Our job was to figure out, can we deliver to the patient? What is their care plan? What are their viral load numbers over the last several visits? And give them a medical wallet they can carry around on not an iPhone 10, but a flip phone, something very simple. Problem is, South Africa has not very reliable infrastructure, bandwidth very expensive. So we were able to create a very decentralized system to store and deliver this data to patients. We also wanted to make sure the patients trusted the data. Because does everyone trust government? Does everyone trust Google or Facebook? Mm, I don't know. But this idea that you could put it in a public ledger that guaranteed the data integrity and trustworthiness was appealing. So we used the blockchain not to actually store the data, just to make sure that it wasn't altered, to make sure it was trustworthy, delivering it to the patients and helping them coordinate their care. We also solved another interesting problem. You know that if your name's John Halamka, it's relatively straightforward to match me across different sites of care. There are only 13 Halamkas in the US. But imagine your name is Maria Garcia, and you live in California. You just can't really match across name, gender, date of birth so well. So what we did in South Africa is we used iris scans or retinal scans to match the data to the person. So as they walk into a right to care clinic, we simply say, ah, I'll scan that eye, and I'll pull up all the data we've associated with that eye in the past and ensure your care is coordinated and personalized, avoiding redundant and unnecessary testing. So I'll say, I think the future is very bright. These technologies I've outlined for you today, everything from machine learning and ambient listening and the idea of being able to use trustworthy computing will give us care that I would argue is most likely going to be in your home and on your phone rather than in traditional hospitals or areas of delivery. And last example to show you, imagine you have congestive heart failure. You've had three big glasses of soda and a bunch of Doritos and all that sodium load, all that fluid starting to overload your body. You start to develop shortness of breath. 
So our app, BIDMC at Home, asks you about your care plan, asks you how you've complied, and then takes the data from the devices in your home and says, ah, you've gained seven pounds of water weight in the last 36 hours. This is probably a congestive heart failure exacerbation in the making. So then we can intervene in your home, sending a visiting nurse, double your diuretics, and help with some dietary education. This is happening today. So as I said, not a technology problem, just a psychiatry problem. And I hope that as a society, these are the sorts of things we embrace, and patient-centric care is not five years away, but 18 months. Thanks very much. Have a great day.